grant programs, fifth lecture on the importance of the uh, Gothic, Gothic on the, uh, on the uh, Chart Cathedral. Grant? Thank you, Ann. Are you hearing me well? Yeah. This, of course, is Notre Dame, Paris. How, who could mistake it? We talked about it last time uh, as the uh, church of the, uh, of the capital. And by the way, I should have mentioned that cathedral is properly an adjective, not a noun, but it has become a noun over time. Uh, it means the church that holds the cathedral or the chair of the bishop. And it doesn't mean simply a large church. St. Peter's in Rome is not a cathedral. Uh, it, uh, it means a bishopric, uh, the, the head of the seat of, of the diocese. And uh, this is the cathedral of, of this region. We uh, looked at it as an example of enormous size. Uh, Bill Jones would say ego of a town, and he's quite right about that. I think it was in competition with Long as we'd seen. I should say, too, that uh, Bill has brought to my attention a couple of things I should mention about theological impact on these buildings. This is true especially of Chartres and the Chartres School, that the cross-like plan is meant to uh, evoke a cross, and the three portals, if you see them here, uh, are associated with the Trinity. We saw the enormous growth in size from Long, the simple plan. <coughs> and I asked you here, you'll remember to uh, recall the even number of bays in the nave and the odd number in the choir. And you know now why I mentioned that to you. The difference in the scale the, uh, of the elements. Chartres will be just a little bit higher, but there will be that enormous difference in the size of the nave arcade and the clear story, especially. The view here on the left is of Notre Dame as it was originally, and we saw that over time it fell into competition with Chartres and that little tiny round over the little window above it here were replaced by the much larger windows, with, which led to these dramatic flying buttresses. This would have been work of about 1250. <coughs> and then uh, that same period, the uh, transepts were given these magnificent roses that look out to the sun. I should have mentioned also, and I will now, the um, musical development that happened here under Leonin and Perrotin in the late uh, 1100s, uh, I would have thought perhaps 1180, in which they began to note music not as single notes in a, in a melody, but as composite notes. The idea of a soprano, alto, tenor, and bass part arose here, polyphonic music, and it persisted and uh, uh, was practiced only in regions that had been touched by Rome, and this, of course, is one such region. The West Front, <coughs> meant to have spires, doesn't have them the gallery of kings above the three portals, the rows above that classic uh, facade. I talked about uh, Violet Le Duc as a restorer of Notre Dame and much else in France. These are his work, not original. And so it, there it is as a piece of urban sculpture that I think most of us value enormously, now being restored from its terrible damage. You're all familiar with that. I haven't talked about that much because there have been so many programs on it that are more up to date than anything I can manage. <coughs> 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 
And so we turned to Charlotte. The West Front, I talked to you through the different periods here. The base of the towers and the portals uh, and the three lancet windows above them are work of Suger's time, the 1140s, 1150s. And the South Tower, right the way up to the top, is of that period. The Rose Window dates from the rebuilding after the fire, and I dated it about um, 1220. Then the North Tower, uh, again a, a burned and damaged uh, match to the one on the south. This from the 1500s by Jean de Beauce, a local man, who meant to make it lighter but taller to free it with its base as the original tower designer had done before the rose was in place. Then the fire, June 10th, 1194. The uh, tunic that had been the staple tourist attraction of Sharpa was thought to have been destroyed, you remember, and three days later it was discovered, uh, or other, by other means was uh, somehow found to be intact. And Mary wanted a new and more beautiful home, and she got it. The plan, which now will become the classic plan for several cathedrals to follow, prominent transepts, odd number of bays in the nave, and you remember that committed the future mason to a four-part rather than a six-part vault. We finally get that cleaned up into what would seem to have been the obvious thing from the beginning. And then uh, the four bays in the choir, which again commits the builder to a four-part system, seven bays across, three either side, and the crossing. And so it is. Stately, to walk from Notre Dame to Chantre is to take a deep breath and stand tall. It has a stature of scale, grandeur that uh, is new to it. Uh, you can see it very plainly here, not much taller than Paris, but much larger in its elements. The clear story, six times the glass of Paris. And Paris, of course, had to do something about that, and we've seen what they did. I showed you these sections through Chartres with that rather wheel-like flying buttress uh, and a crown by another uh, buttress above it that is for wind loads, the wheeled buttress taking the load uh, the, from the haunches of the vault system. Beautiful drawings. Uh, on the left, the interior elevation, and on the right, the exterior. This gives you a view of the interior. We're in the side aisle and looking toward the main volume. The uh, zone that is uh, those four arched openings, I've used the term triforium, and I should, I suppose, have defined it. That is the triforium area above the nave arcade and below the clerestory, which is comprised of two, I call them lancet windows, and the rose above. The exterior, the, the uh, chapels of the Chevet and the, the uh, flyers above, and here the flyers of the nave. So the fire and the result. And there has been, or was, a 
that the better part of a century of debate about which way Chartres was built. It seems like a really pedantic issue, but in fact, knowing one scheme or the other tells us a good bit about the design priorities of its time. You see here at the center of the image uh, that big rose window, and then over to your left is the west front with its spires, and between them is that row of clerestory windows, and the one on the far left, nearest the west front, is pinched. You can perhaps see it here, the one at farthest left, the rose is smaller. Do you see that? And I can show you one more that will really help you. It's been squeezed in. Very strange. What does it suggest? It suggests that the building was done from the choir toward the west, uh, from the east toward the west, and there was perhaps a scheme to get rid of the west front entirely and build a new. And they ran out of money, or they decided they liked the west front after all, and this was squeezed in uh, as a kind of expedient way of getting the thing done. That, uh, that position would then argue that it was begun at the choir and worked uh, toward, the, toward the west front. It was done from, west, from east to west. But the buttresses, the flying buttresses of the nave look to be much earlier than those of the choir. These are almost Romanesque in their round-headed arches, uh, that wheel-like form that tumbles down from, the, uh, from the, the vaults. Whereas in the choir, they seem more progressive. Lighter shafts, uh, pointed arches, and those little roundels cut into the solid material above the those kinds of forms. This argues that it was built from the west front eastward and finished in the choir. And there was a lot of ink spilled over which was what. <laughs> and it intrigued me. I thought about it for quite a long time and didn't know which way to come down. Until in 1978, I ran across an article by an Australian architect named John James. And James proposed that the whole thing was done just from the bottom up, with the nave perhaps five or six feet ahead of the choir. And the difference, James argued, was not in time, but in the different teams and their ways of working, their, the different styles that the teams utilized. And to make his point even more clear, we have the Western Rose that was done by the team that did the Nave Flyers. And you can see that bunch of round-headed arches and the columns below here made into a wheel around the central form. Uh, this was the same team, John James called it Olive. He named his teams by colors. The first was Scarlet. This was our, uh, Olive uh, of nine teams that he identified. And he argued that the, um, the Olive team had done the Western Rose Lake and had done the um, Nave Arcade that you see uh, in, in its time. So that told us what we, I think, now can regard as the way of doing it, but it opened the whole idea of the signatures and ways of working of these teams. And we now know that they had considerable freedom in the way that they executed the larger scheme. They were free to use their own details, their own moldings, ways of handling windowsills, uh, foot measures, the lot. And I was quite convinced by John's argument. It seemed to me that it was irrefutable. He had spent 10 years on the site working out the teams, and he had published his work in three wonderful volumes in which he presented drawings of every year of its construction, right through to 1225, when we think they put down their tools and left it. Thank <laughs> you.
this led me to go to Chartres and spend the summer of 1980 with John, uh, first just wandering all over the place at Chartres. We had, because of his reputation that he had built with the people there, we had free run of the place. And we could go anywhere. This is a view from the Triforium. It's my own photograph. I took it trembling in fear. <laughs> I was standing at about at, at the in the Triforium. You see the extreme lower left that diagonal cutting across under the Triforium. I was standing in the Triforium just there. And over my left shoulder was the glass. And I was scared stiff. <laughs> I'm afraid of heights, I suppose many of you are. But I thought, well, I've come thousands of miles to experience this. I better do it or not. And I learned to conquer, to some extent, my fear of heights. And it let me wander for weeks all over the place with John. This a view from Jean de Beau's North Tower. We're looking here along the nave, down at those wheel-like flying buttresses, and across to the uh, north transept with its tower base for the spire that never happened. Perhaps you can see, maybe I can use this pointer to pick it up. My hand shakes and I bump it and then it goes all over the place. I better, I better not uh, hit this. The little door that opens onto the uh, roof of that uh, tower, tower base, perhaps you can see it. That was where we came out of the new old stair onto our, our uh, <laughs> <laughs> This gives you an idea of the scale of these efforts. Mason's working at this night. Yeah. Here we were looking across to the South Tower, and I would ask you to notice the subtle skill with which that South Tower is blended from a square lower down to an octagon above by means of these diagonal little turret-like things that I think are very suave, very suave transition from square to an octagon, beautiful work. <clears throat> but we went, I went with John to, we had a microbus, we drove all over the place and slept in the thing. We um, went to a number of other sites and I began to feel that John wasn't being quite honest with his work. He would say, um, the stair, that fifth riser is taller than the rest, that's where we have a change of team. And I'd go and uh, measure it, and I wouldn't get that same difference. Um, he was fudging his word. <clears throat> so I, I got suspicious, and I went back and spent 10 days at Chartres measuring everything I could of his work, checking everything <laughs> I could check, and I couldn't find a single flaw. He had done his work accurately and carefully and honestly at Chartres, and then had fallen in love with his method and abused it. And that cost him. His work at Chartres ought to be respected as absolutely crucial work about that site, but it isn't. He threw away his credibility, and that is a great pity. Um, he's since gone completely bonkers. He's now, I think, holding Chautauquas about um, how to draw our inner energies from the Great Pyramid. Um, he's just, I don't know whether he's still alive. I haven't followed his career after that. Um, but he threw away the credibility that his work so deserves as John's mom's the baby. Chantal 
is considered the classic of the French Gothic. Why? <coughs> Several reasons. It has all of its glass, and uh, it is the only one that can claim that, but it also uh, had from the beginning the best glass. It, was, uh, it had a reputation for having the best in France and having it all. The glass at Bourges is equally good, but there isn't much of it. And uh, Chartres was able to keep its glass and its, uh, its fabric because of the geography. France and Amiens, Soissons, other sites long, are well east of Paris. And as the wars have happened over the centuries, they've experienced damage. France was pounded to almost rubble in the first war. We'll talk about that next time around. Uh, Chartres, far southwest of Paris, and therefore never part of the uh, military squabbles that so damaged the, uh, the other sites east of Paris. But it also is on bedrock. Its foundations are on bedrock, and the stone of which it's made, a limestone from the quarries at Bercher, the limestone of which it's made is remarkably hard. When I taught this class at the university, I had a couple of bits of the limestone from Chartres. I didn't break them off, I wouldn't do that, but they were standing sitting around. And they were, where they had broken, they were like a knife. Just really hard stuff. So it hasn't moved. It hasn't been uh, affected by time. It is exactly as it was when the workers put down their tools in about 1225. And so it stands as a classic. Um, what do I want to tell you? Uh, yes, it's a classic also because of the um, plan, which became highly influential. It became the plan that would uh, really affect the cathedrals to follow, with only the exception of Bourges, which is quite a different scheme. Otherwise, Amiens, France, Soissons, the Lot, Beauvais are uh, influenced, are, are really refinements or developments from the Charge scheme. So it's considered the classic, yeah, as we see it. It is also a classic because of the experience that it held. We see it here as uh, hovering over the town. The town from a distance appears to be flat. In fact, it's quite a hilly little town. This is not going like that. There, it uh, appears to be quite flat here, and I should tell you, too, that these views are protected by the French government. I'm glad to know that that is so. No, no tall building can be built within, the, uh, within these views that are ahead of the town. This is a profile, a horizon that will stay by statute. Good for them. The town then is surprisingly hilly, and uh, <coughs> the river Ear flows through it, down at the lower part of the town. Here on the left is that um, sort of deck that is out over the river. That's the deck of the restaurant I used to use every morning when I was patter puttering around Chartres. Nice little restaurant with a view to our right up the hill to the cathedral. It's a considerable climb. We cross the bridge and climb our way through the town. 
This is Malcolm Miller's house. Some of you who have been to Shafa know Malcolm. You've heard him speak on the glass. He is the authority on the glass of Shafa. He's done it for decades. He came out of Cambridge and decided to do this to try to earn some money while he finished his doctorate. The doctorate is as yet undone and he has become the expert on Chartres glass. He is an acquaintance, I wouldn't say we're close friends, but I know him. And he's invited me to his home a couple times. It's a delightful place. Done about the time Jean Lebos was putting up that North Tower. We would pass the one of the grand transepts, the south porch of the south transept, as we approach the west front. <coughs> A different period here. The rose by olive that I've shown you. <laughs> I love that rose. I beautiful rose. It's not um, up to the times, it's use of the round arch. And you see that he's generated that uh, opening with the round arches with two circles, one larger than the other, that fall tangent to one another. Geometry, always geometry. Augustine says the square and the circle are the keys to the order of heaven itself. And Olive here is playing with that idea. Beautiful rose. And we stand here near the three portals with the facade rising above us. And the portals. <coughs> they are comprised of the three tympana, the uh, arched pieces above the lintels, and figures along the jams uh, right the way across in all three portals. The figures seem columnar and some critics don't like them for that reason that they give away too much to the architecture and do not let the bodies emerge as a kind of full uh, sculptural form. I feel differently. I like them very much. I think their relationship to the columnar nature of the portals otherwise is a beautiful thing, and I don't see it as a weakness at all. I like, I like these pieces. And I'd call your attention here to the garments. You see the, the way the drapes, uh, the drapery is handled, the uh, tying across at the waist and then the, the piece comes down and is gathered, the, the gathering and the ascension down by the feet. This is work that would have been modeled, I suppose, on Rome, on Roman work that would have been known here. Um, but it's, um, well, I think it's good. Um, and this would have been done in the lodges by one of the masons in the lodge. The um, master mason who committed to do this work would have taken it all on, and that would have included the sculptural work as well as the vault ribs and the webs and the columns and the rest of it. This was work by someone in the lodge who would have been trained and had the talent to do this kind of thing. He'd have been called a Freemason, not because of any civic freedom, but because he worked the stone free of faults. That was set aside for him to work his sculptural uh, talents. And then the tympanum above. Christ surrounded by the four evangelists. Upper left is Matthew, the man, and upper right is Mark, and then Luke and John below. And 12 
I guess saints, we don't know who they are, gathered within these four uh, triplet arch things over their heads, with one at each side as an extra 14 figures. And at their center, of course, is Christ's figure, surrounded by the beasts of the apocalypse. Christ in majesty and in judgment. <clears throat> I call your attention here again to the drapery, to the garment uh, done by the Freemason within the lodge, who is obviously talented, skilled at this kind of thing. I almost wonder whether this mason was chosen because of the talent of his sculptural people. It's a beautiful thing, is it not, the way that the garment is handled. Christ in judgment. I suppose there are millions of representations of Christ around the globe in one place or another. I know only a very few. Of that few, this one touches me. A man of sorrow is an acquaintance with grief. He presides over this tympanum, and this tympanum is unlike any that we've seen before in an important way, and perhaps you've already seen it. There is no hell here. There is no hell here. <coughs> and of all the scenes of Christ's life, the one that is not represented in this cathedral is the crucifixion. Furthermore, no martyr is shown with the instruments of his martyrdom. There is no Saint Denis here holding his head. It was done with obviously a policy of complete avoidance of violence. This is a cathedral that is dedicated to peace and care. Love, if you like. These figures accompany us. I have passed by them I don't know how many times in going in and out of this building. <coughs> And um, columnar they may be, but I have almost come to regard them as friends, and perhaps you can see from this why that might be so, they're my friends. They accompany me into this cathedral. I listened once to Shane, well twice, to Seamus Heaney. One of his talks was uh, to the point of why we have poetry. And he said, uh, at the close of a lengthy examination of the question, we have poetry because it lets us express things that we can't express in any other way. And that is the case with me, with the remainder of this visit. I have written a poem about the windows of Shapa and I'm going to use it to talk us through the remainder of our time. The noble portal figures usher me into that vast and dusky volume from whose bedrock floor the columns burnished by eight centuries to amber sheen, ascend above the windowless triforium past iridescent lancet pairs to hold in armatures of stone roses of vermilion 
emerald and azure crowning every bay. So the nave of seven bays proceeds. Then, at the crossing, wheels of olive, indigo, and crimson claim the breadth and height to north and south, while to the east, four nave-like bays presage the seven violet and scarlet lances that illuminate the choir, countering the loveliest of western roses of its time or any time. These mirrored shards of glass in this, the greatest and the darkest of cathedrals, glow with unexampled radiance. For nothing is except by contrast, and this master mason, having taken all the light there was to take, has framed his light in darkness. As I have talked you through this, it is an experience that no one living can now enjoy. They've painted the interior and the glass is all washed out. Uh, the glow, the unexampled radiance is no more. They've even painted the exterior. They've painted my friends and I resent it. <laughs> <laughs> and with that I'm going to close today's talk. We'll deal with questions if you like next week. I'll see you then. I hope you've enjoyed my tour. Sharpa, bye-bye.